Hello, and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Freeman, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Scott Daly. Hey, uh, hey Matt, you want some um, you want some berries? Sure, I love berries. Sh- sugar? Sugar? No. Thank you. Oh, oh, please. I insist. And then Matt eats the berries and it dies. End of skit. Hello, everyone. <laughs> And welcome to the Doof Book Club. I hope you're all having a wonderful Friday evening. I'm sure we know a lot of the folks out there. But if you are new, if this is your very first book club experience, hello. I am Scott Daly, and that's Matt Freeman. We said that already. But uh, we are Doof Media, and we make podcasts all about the stories that we love. We also host and arrange and organize this monthly book club. Matt, what is a book club? Well, each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all of the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. And then we meet here on the last Friday of the month and spend a little bit of time chatting about the book, chatting with you, our listeners. There, there's a there's a ton of people in the chat right now talking. I see John. I see uh, Becky. I see The Fun Pedal. I see Chris. I see Kyrgyzstan. Uh, thank you for wishing me uh, good health. I'm very happy to not be dead. Matt's sick now, by the way, though. That's the fun part is Matt's not feeling well. Don't know if it's COVID, but we we would think that would be rather ironic if I passed it to you via um wires that would be hilarious <laughs> but we're so happy to be here we're so happy to have you all here to talk about this book um speaking of of this book matt what is this book this book is we have always lived in the castle by shirley jackson and all the right. summary is as follows my name is mary Catherine blackwood i am 18 years old and i live with my sister constance I have often thought that with any luck at all, I could have been born a werewolf, because the two middle fingers of both my hands are the same length, but I have had to be content with what I had. I dislike washing myself, and dogs, and noise. I like my sister Constance, and Richard Plantagenet, and Amanita Philoides, the death cat mushroom. Everyone else in my family is dead. That's cheating, because that's not a summary, that's just the opening words of the book. That is... They stole our thunder from us. Ultimate cheating, yes. Yeah. That's very disappointed in whoever wrote this. Yeah, so we are going to talk all about this book. Uh, the book is pretty short, so I think this is going to be a pretty short episode, both for the fact that the book's only 150 pages and also that Matt's not feeling well, so we're not going to hang out for multiple hours. We're going to come in, we're going to talk about this book, and then we're going to let Matt go to bed, because if the one thing I learned last week, it's bed is good. Bed is good. Bed is good. Um, before we get into We Have Always Lived in the Castle, though, we have a little bit of work to do because, as you will see here, the poll on our Patreon for what we are covering next month has concluded and there is a winner. However, we do allow those who attend the book club live to get an extra vote in. So here are the, is the vote as it stands right now. The Brandon Sanderson book, The Emperor's Soul, is clinging to a two-vote lead over The Sparrow, but... It's not over yet. You guys get to vote. I am going to send you a copy of the straw poll right now. If I can figure out where the share button is, there it is. Um, You are allowed to vote for two of the five options on the poll. And I will say before you vote, this is probably going to be the last month uh, The Emperor Soul by Brandon Sanderson is on the poll. Um, Apparently, it's been on there for half a year, and I just didn't realize that. And so we're going to say if Brandon can't win this time, he's lost his opportunity and uh, and he's leaving the poll. So um, let that swayed your vote. Sway your vote. Swayed. Swayed your vote in any, any way you want it to go. Uh, we will leave this poll open for the rest of the show, and we will close it right before the end, and then we will declare the winner of the poll and what book we are reading next month. That's right. All right. Um, swayed you vote. Yeah. <laughs> I love. I forgot how to talk in the uh, the time I was away from podcasting. Matt and I recorded our, our episode of Kingslingers last night, and we were talking about the fact that this is the longest we had gone without speaking to each other over the internet in uh, seven years. <laughs> in all seriousness, I think that that is true. Yes, it's wild. 
And yeah. it was, I think it was 14 days. So that's the longest we've gone without talking uh, since since this whole thing started. <laughs> a substantial percentage of our lives. Yes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right. Um, that is the poll. It's up. Get voting. Did I, did that work? Oh, no, I'm on my, why am I on my, you're going to, uh, that's annoying. <laughs> since I'm on my account, it didn't actually put it as a URL. Um, oh, okay. It, hold on. See, that's so weird. Hang on, folks. Sorry about that. Let me, uh, why am I me? Don't know. Don't know, Scott. I, that's a really deep question, actually. Yeah, it is. This is so confusing because I'm definitely on the Doof Media um, thing because obviously I'm streaming through it. But when I go into the chat, it's it's me. And I'm afraid. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This should work. There it is. There it is. Sorry about that, folks. The is joys it? of doing it live. It should be out there, is it not? Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. It's weird. When I pop out the chat, it transforms into <coughs> my personal account. But when the chat is just in the YouTube studio thing, it's the the Doof Media account. Hilarious. That's true, John. How, how am I, Scott? I don't know the answer to that. And why not Matt? Well, because I'm not. See, Matt's sick. I told you. It's gonna be. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good, everybody. All right, let's get into it, Matt. Let's talk about. Let's talk about our book. Let's talk about we have always lived in the castle. Um, uh, for those of you that are new, at the beginning of the episode, we like to just do like an overall. What did you think of the book before we get into the nitty gritty? And while I am asking Matt this question, I also like to ask you, folks in the audience. So, had you read this book before this book club, and what did you think of we have always lived in the castle? Matt, you go first. Well, I've I've seen that this has been called Shirley Jackson's masterpiece, and while I have not read any other Shirley Jackson except the short story here or there, the I feel like that might be warranted. Um, it's just a tight little masterwork, every word perfectly chosen. Um, it makes you think a lot. Like I found after I put it down, I kept ruminating, like, well, what was. I, I would start with a question or I'd be like, I'm just confused about this thing. And then, I, and then I would just think about it and I'd be like, well, I, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, and, and it, it, it like unfolds the more you think about it, yeah. which is my favorite kind of book, the kind of book that really re rewards your own picking it over and thinking about it and revisiting it. Um, and just, just very, just very creative. And I'm not going to say fun because it's like, not fun actually oh, it's, it's horribly depressing it's, but yeah very depressing but like somehow still just like rivetingly entertaining i think is the word i want to i want to go for um, yeah i think that's fair what do you think yeah um so i had read i mean i think everyone probably if you grew up in the american school system read the lottery because i feel like that was just a shirley jackson short story i think that's i don't think that was a full novel um that, that we had to read in school. Um, I also read The Haunting of Hill House a few years ago because I, I read a Stephen King Dance Macabre book that he kind of talks about all the best horror fiction in the 20th century, and that was one of the ones at the very top of his list. And so I was like, I got to read this. Um, and I loved, I loved The Haunting of Hill House. And man, I really enjoyed this book. I really did. I think you're absolutely right that the Shirley Jackson's masterpiece fits there, although I, I like Haunting of Hill House as well. Um, there's just a way she writes, and, and I think these two books are very similar um, to the people that have read Hill House might, might agree with me on that, but just the, the way that she writes this kind of atmospheric dread and, and oppressiveness is, is just so alluring to me. I love the structure of this book. I love the point of view. I love how information is doled out. I just think, I think tight is a really great word it, i mean it's 140 something pages i read it basically over, over the course of two sessions and I, I, it's just an incredible incredible read and it's so funny that we it, this comes off the back of the terror last month which is a very very long book that was kind of very stretched and drawn out that, that i still very much enjoyed it's kind of interesting to see this is almost the opposite of that and that this is like it wants to get in it wants to bring up questions and not actually maybe give you answers or not the answers you want i think a lot of this book chal is challenging your your like desire to put things in buckets 
and say this good, this bad, and I don't, I, 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 I don't, I can't do that, and I want to at times, and I can't do that with this book. So yeah, no, I totally loved it. Yeah, just to riff on that, like it seemed like every time I thought I knew what direction the book was going or what kind of book we were in, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. it uh, went a different direction. Not not and not in a way that felt like it was jerking me around and like, oh, I'm playing with genre tropes. It was just like, no, no, this is just a very specific story. And you're, and by trying to fit it into a genre box, you're just going to keep making mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. only genre box that it fits in is that like, yes, there is a mystery element to it, but what's funny is the mystery is actually pretty obvious. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I think I guessed it before it was revealed. Um, but yeah. it's it's kind of staring you in the face. And one of the things I I did as I was going through pulling slides was realize just how how staring you in the face it is. Almost in the the very first words of the book, it's kind of telling you. Well, I, I feel like it was almost so so staring you in the face that that you kind of go, well, I'm supposed to think it's her, so it so it's probably not her. Yeah, yeah. And then you look for and and then it's like no, no, no that. We're not. That's not the game that's being played here. It's, yeah. it's that it's her, and it kind of doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. we'll talk about that. Uh, John says it was a delightful read. They loved every minute of it. Kyrgyzstan says they had not read any of it, or it or any Shirley Jackson except for the lottery, and they liked it. Weird and good. I think that's a <laughs> weird and good is a perfect, perfect <laughs> explanation of this book. Chris said uh, this is one of their their favorites, but they know it's not for everyone. Yeah, I, I guess so. I'm trying to imagine a person who. Not that I'm saying it's wrong to dislike this book, but like what specifically about it would make people go like, ah, eh, not for me, you know? Yeah, I can imagine being like, oh, the ending was anticlimactic or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, sure. Fun pedal, the fun pedal say they enjoyed it thoroughly, mm -hmm. especially the audio version, which was well performed. I agree with that. I listened to the audio version. Do you know who did uh, it? No, I forgot. Okay. There wasn't a voice I recognized. Um, okay. Becky Becky says they finished it 30 seconds before this uh, recording started. So perfect, that's cool. perfect timing, Becky. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's interesting here. We'll, we'll get into this, but Kirkstan points out that Mary never talks to with Julian at any point, Uncle Julian at any point in the book. Which I mean, like, <laughs> I, I swear to God, I was. I was convinced for, for whatever reason, five pages into this book, I was like, one of these people's a fucking ghost. There's definitely a ghost here. One of them's a ghost. And then at one point in the book, Julian goes, oh, but she's been dead for six years. And I was like, I fucking knew it. And then, of course, that's not uh, what it is at all. But, I mean, that's 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 part and parcel, I think, of the way Shirley Jackson is fucking with your expectations. I think one, that one of the, one of the uh, perfect ways to describe a master storyteller is someone that knows that can know exactly what you're thinking and where you're going and anticipate that and use that to manipulate you and i think shirley jackson's just so good at that yeah toward the beginning i was like wait a minute is this is this like what the others is based on no mm -hmm. not at all <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 all right you want to you want to get into it yeah let's do it mm -hmm. so as always we begin with the first words of the book uh again my name is Mary Catherine Blackwood. I am 18 years old, and I live with my sister Constance. I have often thought that with any luck at all, I could have been born a werewolf, because the two fingers, the two middle fingers on both my hands are the same length, but I have had to be content with what I had. I dislike washing myself, and dogs, and noise. I like my sister Constance, and Richard Plantagenet, and Am Amanita Philoides, the death cup mushroom. Everyone else in my family is dead. The last time I glanced at the library books on the kitchen shelf, they were more than five months overdue, and I wondered whether I would have chosen differently if I had known that these were the last books, the ones which would stand forever on our kitchen shelf. We rarely moved things. The Blackwoods were never much of a family for restlessness and stirring. We dealt with the small surface transient objects, the books and the flowers and the spoons, but underneath we had always a solid foundation of stable possessions. We always put things back where they belonged. We dusted and swept under tables and chairs and beds and pictures and rugs and lamps, but we left them where they were. The tortoise shell toilet seat on our mother's dressing table was never off place. Sorry, toilet set on our mother's dressing table it was never off place by so much as a fraction of an inch. Blackwoods had always lived in our house and kept their things in order. As soon as a new Blackwood wife moved in, a place was found for her belongings, and so our house was built up with layers of Blackwood property weighting it and keeping it steady against the world. It was on a Friday in late April that I brought the library books into our house. 
Fridays and Tuesdays were terrible days because I had to go into the village. Someone had to go to the library and the grocery. Constance never went past her own garden, and Uncle Julian could not. Therefore, it was not pride that took me into the village twice a week, or even stubbornness, but only the simple need for books and food. It may have been pride that brought me into Stella's for a cup of coffee before I started home. I told myself it was pride and would not avoid going into Stella's no matter how much I wanted to be at home, but I knew, too, that Stella would see me pass if I did not. All right, Matt, what do you think of the opening of this book? I mean, it's it's kind of really lays out its style almost immediately here. Yeah, well, we've got this super, super close first person, mm-hmm. um, almost to the point of being, you know, the, the sort of unreliable narrator. Everything is distorted by the perception of the narrator. Oh, the, yeah. You, you, you sometimes wonder if you're actually getting a clear image of the world around her uh, because she has such a specific worldview. Um, yeah. You know, I I think a lot of this kind of passed over me the first time, but but yeah, now now that I'm rereading it, I'm seeing these elements of like the house as this this place of permanence where everything is oriented around just these these objects that they that are almost like holy relics. Yeah. To to this character and um and I guess to a lesser degree to her sister as well. Um, uh, that's that's definitely a, a major thing that recurs throughout the book, so it's not surprising to see it here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think about Mary Catherine as a as a character here? Because I mean, one of the things that really struck me, you know, the the second line of the book is I am 18 years old. And if it wasn't for that, I would have aged her, you know, much much younger than that. And I think, you know, here is where she sounds the most 18, but I think I feel like the more we live in her head, the younger and younger and younger she seems. And I think that's very deliberate on Shirley Jackson's a point here i think this is a character who as we learn more and more about her realize that she really is still just a, a child like totally yeah. like it has the mindset of a child and and okay a, a psychopath as well but um i think it's really interesting because i think you know shirley jackson wanted to immediately establish that this person is supposed to be 18 years old supposed to be an adult pretty much but in no point a dude did they act like one in any any part of this book at all? I felt like she was mentally stuck at the sort of developmental age of being about twelve, which yeah. is yeah, um, which is what you know how old she would have been when the the event happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I totally agree with you that I okay, honestly, I forgot that the book began with it saying, <laughs> "Oh, she's eighteen years old." So sure. I just mentally kind of visualized her as like twelve or thirteen for the entire book. Mm-hmm. And um, I think toward the end, I like remembered like, wait a second, I'm I'm like, I'm not thinking about this right because th- th- they mentioned the ages at some point, and I figured, and I'm like, oh, oh crap, she's like way older than I thought. But um, but yeah, the point is that she's she's stuck at the age th- that she was when uh, yeah when this happened. Although, so so one thing I'll say, it, it, I guess there's no, it doesn't matter. We we, we always talk about things out of order. I will say. <laughs> The idea of like a five-year-old, um, or or like a seven-year-old even maybe, like poisoning the, their family in just like a fit of childish rage, is kind of like an understandable tragic mistake. Yeah. But I feel like a twelve-year-old doing the same thing is not, <laughs> um, and. And 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 then so just kind of to like bracket that and then say like, what the hell was going on in that house? Like the book never actually really says like how bad were things actually in that house? Yeah, we get little fleeting glances and glimpses of what the what the the home life situation actually was, right? And then and then I I think one of the most interesting thing is and I pulled a slide for it is when Mary Catherine is sitting in their summer house, you know quote unquote reliving a scene of peop of her family sitting around the dinner table talking and what they all are talking about is how wonderful Mary Catherine is and how we should never punish her, which is obviously just a complete creation of her mind. Um, but the, and the way she wanted to be treated. And I think you're right though. I mean, this is the fascinating thing about this book. She's 18 acts 12, but when she was 12, the, the outrage, the thing that she did was more suited to like a five or six year old who didn't really understand and whose sister taught her about poison and perhaps didn't understand what murdering your entire family actually meant, actually means in a, in a permanence kind of way. Right. 
and, and so the, but that's the thing that okay so the, the reason I mentioned it I guess or the I'm, I'm trying to, to, to get a handle on or, or to articulate maybe the kind of ambiguity that pervades this book and like mm-hmm. that's just mm-hmm. the first example of, of the ambiguity where it's like okay so did she kill them all because she's just a monster or because it was kind of a tragic mistake that that um you could sort of imagine anyone doing if if they were in a moment of just like extreme anger or was her family actually extremely horrible and this was a sort of almost i don't want to say justified because like murdering a bunch of people's poison isn't justified (laughs) but like like a desperate attempt to escape a terrible situation and and all and none of these possibilities are really dismissed and all of them are sort of brought up as possible yeah I mean, I would say that the fact that she seems to have no remorse or empathy at all hints a certain way, but I agree with you that it's not set in stone for sure. So, so one, so he like he, that's the thing. Part of me totally agrees that she has no remorse and empathy. Part of me thinks that the way that she treats Uncle Julian is a sort of like sublimated empathy, where it's like what she she understands what she did to him is so horrible and unforgivable that she has like created this whole way of existing around him where she just kind of pretends that she's dead effectively because she can't bear the the like pain of what she did to him which is which is which would be empathetic if it was true but the book doesn't actually say that that's true the the book doesn't say any of this for sure it just kind of shows what's happening you know yeah and and she she specifically avoids thinking about these things. She just thinks I should be kinder to uncle Julian, like, like mm-hmm. as a mantra. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're right. I, I think that's a great transition because that's actually in our, our next slide here, which I want to talk about. Um, so here's the next slide. This is uh, Mary Catherine sitting at the bar um, and, and Jim, one of the great townspeople comes up and starts harassing her. I wished he would not sit so close to me. Stella came towards us on the inside of the counter, and I wished she would ask him to move so I could get up and leave without having to struggle around him. They tell me you're moving away, he said solemnly. No, I said, because he was waiting. Funny, he said, looking from me to Stella and then back. I could have sworn someone told me you'd be going soon. No, I said. Coffee, Jim? Stella asked. Who do you think would start a story like that, Stella? Who do you think would have wanted to tell me they're moving away when they're not doing any such thing? Stella shook her head at him, but she was trying not to smile. I saw that my hands were tearing at the paper napkin in my lap, ripping off a little corner, and I forced my hands to be still and made a rule for myself. Whenever I saw a tiny scrap of paper, I was to remember to be kinder to Uncle Julian. "'Can't ever tell how gossip gets around,' Jim Donnell said. "'Perhaps someday soon Jim Donnell will die. Perhaps there was already a rot growing inside him that was going to kill him.' "'Did you ever hear anything like the the gossip in this town?' he asked Stella. "'Leave her alone, Jim,' Stella said." Uncle Julian was an old man, and he was dying, dying regrettably, more surely than Jim, Donnell, and Stella, and anyone else. The poor old Uncle Julian was dying, and I made a firm rule to be kinder to him. We would have a picnic lunch on the lawn. Constance would bring his shawl and put it over his shoulders, and I would lie on the grass. I'm not bothering anyone, Stella. Am I bothering anyone? I'm just asking Miss Mary Catherine Blackwood here how it happens that everyone in town is saying that she and her big sister are going to be leaving us soon, moving away, going somewhere else to live. He stirred his, around his coffee. From the corner of my eye, I could see the spoon going around and around and around, and I wanted to laugh. There was something so simple and silly about the spoon going around while Jim Donald talked. I wonder if he would stop talking if I reached out and took hold of the spoon. Very likely he would. I told myself wisely, very likely he would throw the coffee in my face. So a lot of interesting stuff in here. I want to talk about the Uncle Julian stuff. I want to get back to that. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about the structure of this book, especially this opening, because I think it's really interesting the way Shirley Jackson tells us about how they are ostracized and hated by the town before she tells us the reason for it. Like, we don't know anything at this point. We know that that Mary Catherine's entire family is dead, but we don't actually know about the murders we don't know about constance being the one suspected of the murder and going on trial and ended up being acquitted we know none of this we just know that the town hates them that everyone in the town seems to dislike them and and you can kind of i think the thing your brain does is you kind of maybe attach this to a lot of other stories about this where they're the 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 rich high class family that lives off on a manor just outside of town and so the everyday working people of the town just resent them generally and i i certainly think that is part of the reason they they hate the Blackwoods but like you just kind of decide that and without knowing 
that they've done anything horribly and, and that there is a murderer living up in that house, which there there definitely is. Right. Yeah. It, it's um, it's one of those. It's yet another one of these sort of misdirects where you feel like you're you're going to find out like, oh, OK, well, what is the we're going to find out the reason why everyone hates these two poor women. And it's like, oh, because one of them might be a murderer. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then you're like, so why do they hate both of them? <laughs> right. And why do they hate the crippled old man who like, like it does like the hate doesn't make sense. And the, the, especially like the level of the hate, like it's like, you know, at the end, as, as we'll see when they trash their house, it's like, oh, these are, this is just horrible. There's these people are just, just awful. Um, and it's, you know, and, th- and then they feel remorse about it later. And it's like, oh, so this is, you know, not surprising coming from the author of the lottery, but it's like, this is a kind of like scapegoating mm-hmm. mob mentality. Yeah. Where everyone has agreed that these are the scapegoats. These are the people that we're going to hate together. And find our solidarity in in hating these people yeah and certainly the murder and the 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 suspected crime give them a kind of a funnel for that particular thing but i think you're right i mean a lot of what this book is doing is kind of talking about ostracization and the ways in which people are isolated for being different and the ways in which that is tolerated in some instances and not tolerated in others and and one of the reasons i love the book so much is because there are moments where you like want to be like hell yeah girls like fuck these people live on your own don't you don't need them just but then you're like oh yeah but one of you is deeply unwell and capable of murdering people you know and so like it it, like when we get to cousin charles coming in the dude's actually making a lot of good points i mean he's a jerk like i don't like him at all he's he's a greedy son of a bitch but he's also like hey Uncle Julian needs to go to a hospital. He's clearly unwell. He should be taken care of at a hospital somewhere. Um, uh, Mary Catherine is clearly unwell as well. She should be getting treatment in any way possible. Like going and hiding up in this place is not the answer, but also these, these people that are surrounding them are terrible people. And that's why I like, I love that there's no easy answer in any of this. Yeah. There's a lot. And, and consequently, there's just a ton of conversation happening in the chat. Like, um, you know, John is pointing out that that Mary Catherine really kind of clinically seems like she's a psychopath. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she she enjoys killing small animals and she has no remorse for what she did. And she was she understood what she was doing well enough to have uh, it was sorry, it was someone else who pointed out that she uh, yeah, Becky says she understood what she was doing enough to not to, to make sure not to kill her sister, but to kill everyone else. And, you know, John's John says she she uh, always constantly imagines killing everyone around her. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so like all of this is true. Right. But (laughs) (laughs) like like I I I found myself taking her side a lot and I'm not disagreeing with what anyone said. It, it, It was to me, it was just like, why can't these goddamn people leave them alone? Mm hmm. Like, like they don't, de- they don't deserve this kind of treatment. And, um, and it's like, I, I, I okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the end and, and I think that'll be a better opportunity to talk about some of this stuff. Sure, sure, sure. Oh. Um, but uh, let's, let's talk, let's go back to uncle Julian though, because I think something that someone else pointed out in chat was the idea that on this first page here, my name is Mary Catherine Blackwood. I'm 18 years old and I live with my sister Constance, which is true. But you left out a person because you also live with your uncle Julian, who she doesn't mention until two paragraphs down, and just vaguely like, oh, uncle Julian couldn't go to town because he's in a wheelchair and not definitely not well. And so I, I find this this part really interesting here. You know, uh, this the, the, this idea that like I was sitting here being being treated cruelly by this man Jim, and in this moment I said I I made a rule for myself I must be kinder to uncle Julian. What does Uncle Julian have to do with Jim directly? You know, like there's, 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 it seems like a non sequitur that she just decides in this moment, I must be kinder to Uncle Julian. Um, but I, I think that this, it's, it's really fascinating the way in which you're totally right. She meant to kill Uncle Julian, right? Like that, this was the only person at the table that she, she was not trying to kill was Constance. Like if Uncle Julian had had more blackberries that day, he would be dead too. And so, like, 
I, I do kind of agree with you. This is at least on some level an acknowledgement. Someone is being cruel to her. And in this moment, she acknowledges her cruelty that she did to her uncle and says, I need to work at being kinder to him. Although I want to talk to you about these rules she set about sets about for herself, because I think that's a really interesting angle on the character too. Yeah, I agree. Shall we move on or, or is there better? Is there another opportunity to talk about the rules? Uh, I think there is. Let, okay. Let's let's keep going. All right. So here we finally learn what happened to the rest of the, of the Blackwoods, which has been treated as a kind of mystery up until this point. Remember, Uncle Julian sighed, shaking his head happily. Perhaps, he said with eagerness, perhaps you are not familiar with the story. Perhaps I might. Julian, Helen Clark said, Lucille does not want to hear it. You should be ashamed to ask her. I thought that Mrs. Wright very much did want to hear it, and I looked at Constance just as she glanced at me. We were both very sober to suit the subject, but I knew she was full of merriment as I was. It was good to hear Uncle Julian, who was so lonely most of the time. And poor, poor Mrs. Wright, tempted at last beyond endurance, was not able to hold it back any longer. She blushed deeply and faltered, but Uncle Julian was a tempter, and Mrs. Wright's human discipline could not resist forever. It happened right in this house, she said like a prayer. We were all silent, regarding her courteously, and she whispered, I do beg your pardon. Naturally in this house, Constance said, in the dining room, we were having dinner. A family gathering for the evening meal, Uncle Julian said, caressing his words, never supposing it was to be our last. Arsenic in the sugar, Mrs. Wright said, carried away, hopelessly lost to all decorum. I used that sugar, Uncle Julian shook his finger at her. I used that sugar myself on my blackberries. Luckily, and he smiled blandly, fate intervened. Some of us that day, she led inexorably through the gates of death. Some of us, innocent and unsuspecting, took unwillingly that one last step to oblivion. Some of us took very little sugar. I never touch berries, Constance said. She looked directly at Mrs. Wright and said soberly, I rarely take sugar on, on, on anything, even now. I, it counted strongly against her at the trial, Uncle Julian said, that she used no sugar, I mean. But my niece has never cared for berries. Even as a child, it was her custom to refuse berries. I love the way Uncle Julian talks and that he's always writing something in his mind, you know? Yeah. So every sentence he says in his dialogue sounds like a, a book because yeah. that's exactly what he's doing. A family gathering for the evening meal, never yeah. supposing it was to be our last. It's just... <laughs> the, so so the, I don't know if, the, if this is clear, but I always picked up from the way Julian talks, not just here, but pretty much everywhere, that he's pretty sure Constance did it. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you feel that way. Yeah, I mean, like the thing is, the thing, that, the thing that like it, it you do in your mind is it, it, it like it has to be one of the two of them, right? <laughs> and so, like it, it, it's either Constance or or Mary Catherine, and, and like he he is fully of the the opinion that oh, Mary Catherine was dismissed; she was not at the table, and therefore it couldn't have been her. And somehow thinks that she's dead too, which is yes, that, which that's is very confusing. True, yeah, but um, yeah, that's so. So he really so like that. That there's this fascinating like concept of like belonging and forgiveness, where I, I again, this is my opinion. I don't know if anybody else disagrees, but I feel like Julian thinks that Constance killed all of his loved ones and severely you know lifelong injured him but he loves her and she takes care of him and they have a, a, this like what you could call a kind of a beautiful relationship and then constance knows that mary catherine was the one who killed everyone and never judges her and never mm -hmm. holds that against mm -hmm. her just it's not even it doesn't even seem to be a matter of forgiveness it's just like yeah, I know you did this horrible thing. Um, so uh, brunch, you know, like like the, yeah. it, it's it doesn't even require forgiveness because they're like they're a family and like that 
that's all that's all there needs to be you know yeah i mean i think that that kind of gets into the title which i think is is actually really beautiful when you sit and think about it like this idea of we have always lived in the castle this idea of of permanence this idea of you know it said in the very first words that like the blackwoods have always lived here and everything is always in its place and it never moves and it just exists and so what does blame or 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 hatred enter into this thing it doesn't it doesn't we've always lived here we're always going to live here it, it there's there's no sense in resentment for things ha that have been done you know uh, amongst this family and, and this this idea you know there's a lot of ideas in this story and this, this idea that like they are ostracized by society but they are together we the blackwoods live here we have always lived here and we will always live here and and so all we have is each other and so the idea of one of them growing to hate another one of them. I just, I don't think they even consider that as a possibility. At least within this little subgroup. Like it seemed yes, like there yeah. was, it, it seemed like back when it was the full family, there was like a complicated badness. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we get hints of like the, that, you know, Julian's other brother, they don't have a good relationship. And, and yeah, we get little hints and, and pieces of like, things happening in this this home that weren't good you know the fighting amongst parents um julian and his wife weren't getting along julian's brother was very resentful of him being here in this house and eating their food and taking their thing like the 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 one moment where he said like my brother was watching how much my wife was eating you know watching and like calculating and tabulating how much yeah. she was eating and again that's one of those things that we don't know if that's really the way it was or that was just julian's perception of the way his brother felt um but yeah i mean i think that's like when it's it's kind of like the circling of the wagons after this tragedy happens that like we are we're all we have literally yeah. all we have yeah, I was fascinated by this this story of the Blackwood that's kind of told between the lines where, you know, you have the three Blackwood brothers, like two of whom seemed financially um, totally incompetent. And, and you know, the, it seemed like they all three of them inherited a bunch of money and then mm -hmm. two of them just blew it. And then the only one who retained their money was was the father of the two girls. And, and yet he, he was just this kind of. Uh, grasping greedy you know humorless guy who would like keep track of, of of every favor that he thought people owed him on a ledger i, I love that phrase or, uh, however it was written it, mm -hmm. it just just like he's not really creating any value either he's almost just like he he was a better hoarder of the wealth than they were yeah. but that doesn't mean that he's adding any value so you can kind of see why people probably in the town already hated the blackwoods even before this, you know, event happened that made them into pariahs. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things they're said is that, like, the Blackwood land would be incredible farmland that would produce tons of food and value for the town and for the Blackwoods themselves, but they never farm it. They just let it sit there doing nothing. Um, we learned that her fa the, the girl's father put a fence around the entire territory, like, cutting a path that, that – the townspeople used all the time in half, like preventing them from using it just for, for, we don't really ever get a clear reason why he just decided to do that one day. Right. He just said, no, we're doing this. No one can come on our property fences, enclosure, like isolation, isolation, isolation. It's like kind of like, that's, that's one of the interesting things about the story is that like their world keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking to where by the end of the story, their entire world is basically just the kitchen of this house. And that's, that's it. Um, and I like they're that. becoming more and more isolated. Um, That's a and good it, point. I mean, gosh, but there's so much going on here because, like, this scene right here, there are two people here, and I think they represent the, the, the two ways in which people want to deal with the Blackwoods. You have Helen Clark, who decides that these people are abnormal – and they need to rejoin society. They need to conform. They need, like, there's the, one of the reasons people are so resentful of them is because they're so different and not conforming to what society expects of them. And so we need to take them out of this house, get them out of here, get them to live with us, and that we can make them normal again and everything will be okay. And then we have Mrs. Wright, who is the, an example of the person who's kind of titillated by their oddness you know like so we get to this push and pull of like you must conform but it is your lack of conformity that makes me fascinated with you um and so we have these two characters showing up at the same time kind of pushing and pulling the blackwoods in in opposite directions almost and i just find it really fascinating yeah 
Yeah, I love that. That, that. That's one that quality the book has of being just like perfectly constructed where you're totally right that every single character and every single line of dialogue it has like a deep thematic purpose. And mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with what you just said. Yeah. I mean, look, look at like just uh, to that point, it happened right in this house. She said like a prayer, you know, it, it goes really a long way to set up how, how the story of this place has, has got, has grown beyond dealing with people and gone to myth. And we kind of see that, that really exemplified by the end of the story when these two ladies just become almost ghosts, actual ghosts, you know? Yeah. I love that. Um, John right. and, and Fun Pedal are, are comparing the uh, the Blackwoods to the, the Thorburns or the uh, the, mu- the Munsters <laughs> and the Adams. Yeah. Um, All right. Um, I want to talk about this next slide here. So we'll read it and then we'll, we'll spend some time on it. After breakfast on the good mornings when I did not have to go into the village, I had my work to do. Always on Wednesday mornings, I went around the fence. It was necessary for me to check constantly to be sure that the wires were not broken and the gates were securely locked. I could make the repairs myself, winding the wire back together where it had torn, tightening loose strands, and it was a pleasure to know every Wednesday morning that we were safe for another week. On Sunday mornings, I examined my safeguards, the box of silver dollars I had buried by the creek, and the doll buried in the long field, and the book nailed to the tree in the pine woods. So long as they were where I had put them, nothing could get in to harm us. I had always buried things, even when I was small. I remember that once I quartered the long field and buried something in each quarter to make the grass grow higher as I grew taller, so I would always be able to hide here. I once buried six blue marbles in the creek bed to make the river beyond run dry. Here is a treasure for you to bury, Constance used to say to me when I was small, giving me a penny or a bright ribbon. I had buried all my baby teeth as they came out one by one, and perhaps someday they would grow as dragons. All our land was enriched with my treasures buried in it, thickly inhabited just below the surface, with my marbles and my teeth and my colored stones, all perhaps turned to jewels by now, held together under the ground in a powerful taut web which never loosened, but held fast to guard us. On Tuesdays and Fridays, I went into the village, and on Thursday, which was my most powerful day, I went into the big attic and dressed in their clothes. Mondays were neatened. Mondays we neatened the house, Constance and I, going into every room with mops and dust cloths, carefully settling the things back after we had dusted, never altering the perfect line of our mother's tortoise shell comb. Every spring, we washed and polished the house for another year, but on Mondays, we neatened. Very little dust fell in the rooms, but even that little could not be permitted to stay. Sometimes Constance tried to neaten Uncle Julian's room, but Uncle Julian disliked being disturbed and kept his things in their own places, and Constance had to be content with washing his medicine glasses and changing his bed. I was not allowed in Uncle Julian's room. So, I mean, this is just kind of like what her weeks are, right? Like, she's got this this very clear schedule, very ordered thing. Everything is in place. This is the way it works. Um, This is what we do. And, you know, obviously... Uh, cousin charles comes in and messes up this whole thing but i I find this really fascinating Um, i find the the burying of stuff really interesting and i wanted to get your opinion on on what you think her kind of obsession with burying things means so it's interesting because um i forget who said it but early in the chat someone compared this to to like ocd behavior Mm -hmm. and that could that's totally spot on i i think but also that's not something that i was actually thinking while reading like i was thinking she just has this this rich fantasy life that she has retreated into um, either just either due to the way she was brought up or as a way to kind of escape from the feelings caused by what she did or all of the above. Or maybe this is just the way she is. Like, th- th- does it need to have a, a reason per se? So like it, it's a very it's it's kind of it's kind of fun and, and interesting and for a while you actually wonder if like is this the direction we're going to go like does she actually have magic powers um <laughs> i don't know if you wondered that at all but at least it occurred to me briefly like 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 she seems to take the sympathetic magic stuff so seriously that you wonder if there's actually something to it but no it's just it's just that this you know she has a extremely active kind of imaginary world that she retreats into whenever she feels threatened by anything. And I think most importantly, this was entirely reinforced and supported by Constance. Um, and we don't get an idea of whether this was reinforced and supported by the rest of the family. Um, but we can maybe imagine that no, maybe imagine the rest of her family pushed back on these things and said, stop burying things that's wasteful and weird and doesn't do anything. But Constance was always like, oh, here's little trinkets to bury. And I think that's one of the reasons why Constance becomes the favorite because she doesn't push back against her she doesn't punish her she doesn't tell her what to do and i think that's one of the most important things about the rules right the the rules that we talked about 
a couple slides ago and that are again again enforced here this i was not allowed in uncle julian's room the first time you read this book i think you read these rules and you say these are th these are stipulations and requirements that people have put on mary catherine the idea that she's not allowed to go in uncle julian's room is because uncle julian said so or constance said so and we learn as the book goes on that no this is mary catherine this is a, a, mary catherine has given herself rails and borders and rules and these are th all self-imposed and in fact as kirkistan is pointing out in the chat constance is kind of exasperated by these rules at times like at the end where, where she's like i can't go in uncle julian's room i can't do it even though that's the place where the only mattress in the whole house was left and constance is like it doesn't matter mary catherine it doesn't matter she's like no it does matter and so like mary catherine is a person that makes her own rules makes her own guidelines makes her own requirements but if other people do it that's when she gets angry that's when she pushes back and the one person who has never done that to her it seems is constance yeah right well it seems like constance under has always understood that she's unique and and can't be treated the way others are treated and can't be really be you know browbeaten sure um, and, but uh, but <laughs> is that is it good the way constance just kind of placates her constantly you know yeah well yeah i mean you can definitely view it as enabling that's yes that, that's the two sides of uh, so, so 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 just to lay it out one side of the of the dichotomy is like well is it right that constance is enabling these tendencies that she has that are that are abnormal and you could argue self-destructive definitely overtly destructive yeah yeah of if her not, environment and the people yeah. around her uh, but then the other side is what what is she gonna get any better in this life sure yeah what's the alternative and, yeah like what's the alternative it, it, it's not like i don't know when this is supposed to have happened actually because i don't remember there being like a year mentioned but it's like you're gonna send her to an institution mm -hmm. you're gonna you're just going to treat her like an invalid. She probably can't really be trusted to live on her own. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like there's no, there's no answer. There's no answer to so many of these things. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, which I, which I love. Like that's, I, like do too. I, I, I kept going around in circles. Like yeah. when I was thinking about this book, I was like, well, what, but what about this? But what about this? Like it's so complex. I love it. This is one of those things that I, I wanted like the, 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 there's the part of me that wanted a clear definitive answer on this, that wanted to be able to say, no, Constance is wrong for enabling her, that, that her and Constance are kind of self enabling each other, you know, like Constance has this, this strong, like the strong desire to isolate herself. And, and uh, Mary Catherine is perfectly, perfectly willing to play into that. And Mary Catherine has this stubborn streak in her, this, this, this very different personality that, um, and doesn't want anyone to push against her and Constance is completely willing to just kind of let her go. Like, I love that one of the things that, that Constance says when they're talking about the story and why Mary Catherine was not at the dinner table was, Oh, she was such a terror when she was younger. And it's not like Mary Catherine has changed since then. It's just that there's no one there to push back against her to the point where she would like have to have to do something that people don't like, you know, like yeah. there's, there, it's, it's, it's like, there's no one there to tell her what she can't do except for herself. So she's not resisting anything. She's not pushing back against anything. And so she's not a terror, uh, quote unquote anymore. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I, I, I forgot about that line, but you're totally right. And you know, somebody early in the chat mentioned the idea that like you, you could view Mary Catherine as a kind of horror villain. Mm -hmm. Um, like, like, yeah, she's this, this, uncontrollable child who killed her family and yeah. except for the one person who would tolerate and enable her terrible behaviors and uh yeah. i mean there's definitely a version of the story in which the protagonist is charles and he comes into this house trying to save these girls and then over the course of time this creepy 18 year old is is constantly making him more and more uncomfortable um and and he, like constance is just like no no it's fine as chris is pointing out in the chat one of the the most wonderful parts of the book is Charles increasing exa like exasperation of everything that's happening. It's like she nailed a book to a tree and then a like very she nailed a very expensive watch to a tree. And Constance is like, yeah, so so uh -huh. <laughs> like, I don't I don't understand. 
<laughs> yeah. Why did she bury these coins? I don't get it. And and Constance doesn't understand why he doesn't understand. So yeah, I mean, I I I think there is a version of the story that is just the Charles realizes increasingly that he's in danger by yeah. these these crazy women. Um, and and it is really interesting that that is not the story that uh, Shirley Jackson wanted to tell. Well, another candidate for point of view uh, character would be Constance herself. Um, sometimes I even felt like. The, the initial the original conception of the story might have been a character more like Constance and then because very often I felt myself thinking what is Constance thinking right now mm -hmm. why is Constance behaving this way because yeah. she doesn't have the excuse of you know a, a, the distorted perceptions and, and and violent impulses and all of this like like you know, and you see her kind of start to waver, right? When when um, when the cousin starts to to tempt her, and yeah, and, but but then she snaps back, and then and then once she snaps back, it's like it's it's, it's over. She never she never seems tempted again. Um, even even when the house gets set on fire, it never she's never like yeah we should, you know we can't live here. She's just like yeah well, I guess we're gonna have to live in these three rooms. You know, it's yeah, um, and that's that's one of those things that also strikes me as a tragedy of this ending is like it's like Constance, you were so close to perhaps having some semblance of a normal life or, or maybe we'll say a better life. And yeah. then nope. Uh, and, and it's like, I don't know how I, how I feel about that. You know, like that's the thing is I don't know how to feel about this. I don't, I'm yeah. not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. Me neither. Like I, um, I, so, so, so I do think that the audiobook reading was, was great, but there were times when I was like, I feel like the audiobook reader is putting too much of a spin on the way things are said because I think the way the text is written on the page it, it's very ambiguous like 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 Mary Cat would say something extremely wild <laughs> <laughs> and it, and and the only response would be silly Mary Cat mm -hmm. said Constance and, and and I would be like, what tone of voice is that in? <laughs> yeah, like like is she like ex is she just exhausted with this shit? Or is or does she actually think this is amusing? Or is she still? fucking terrified of pushing back against the person who murdered her entire family? That that too, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and 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 like that's the problem with all audiobooks is is like the audiobook reader is choosing to do it one particular way, but I was always like, well, maybe there's there's like many different ways that you could interpret Constance as as like thinking and feeling about all of this. Yeah, because we don't really know. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, it, it is fun to kind of read into that. It, 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 and it could go, it could be any of these, right? Uh, I don't, I don't think it's actually that she was terrified of, of Mary Cat the whole time. I think she genuinely loves this, this girl and she cares deeply about her and wants to protect her. Um, and, and honestly, like whatever resentment she maybe had over the killing of her entire family, I think she's just kind of over that now. Yeah. I think that's the most consistent reading, honestly. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, here in the story is kind of where our inciting incident happens, and that is uh, Cousin Charles coming to live with them. One of these uh, days. Oh, sorry, this is you, isn't it? This is me. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll just pick that up. One of these days, <laughs> she turned her head and listened. He's still asleep, she said. Who is still asleep? Will I watch it grow? Cousin Charles is still asleep, she said, and the day fell apart around me. I saw Jonas in the doorway and Constance by the stove, but they had no color I could not breathe. I was tied around tight. Everything was cold. He was a ghost, I said. Constance laughed, and it was a sound very far away. Then a ghost is sleeping in father's bed, she said, and ate a very hearty dinner last night while you were gone, she said. I dreamed that he came. I fell asleep on the ground and dreamed that he came, but then I dreamed him away. I was held tight. When Constance believed me, I could breathe again. We talked for a long time last night. Go and look, I said, not breathing. Go and look, he isn't there. Silly Mary Cat, she said. I could not run. I had to help Constance. I took my glass and smashed it on the floor. Now go away, I said. Constance came to the table and sat down across from me, looking very serious. I wanted to go around the table and hug her, but she still had no color. My Mary Cat, she said slowly. Cousin Charles is here. He is our cousin. As long as his father was alive, that was Arthur Blackwood, father's brother, Cousin Charles could not come to us or try to help us because his father would not allow him. His father, she said and smiled a little, thought very badly of us. 
he refused to take care of you during the trial. Did you know that? And he never let our names be mentioned in his house. Then why do you mention his name in our house? Because I am trying to explain. As soon as his father died, Cousin Charles hurried here to help us. How can he help us? We're very happy, aren't we, Constance? Very happy, Mary Cat. But please be pleasant to Cousin Charles. I could breathe a little. It was going to be all right. Cousin Charles was a ghost, but a ghost that could be driven away. He'll go away, I said. <laughs> Ominously. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, yeah th this bit um, really reminds me of something I read about the book, which was that I, I believe um, that Shirley Jackson had uh, suffered from agoraphobia. Mm. And that this was like... Uh, a very uh, tr truthful representation of what that s sort of sensation is like, or, or maybe this is blending more into OCD, but I think those might be related. I, I don't really know. Well, I mean, there is definitely something that happens to, to Mary Catherine several times. She uses the word chilled over and over again. When yeah. something happens to her, I was chilled, so I couldn't move. And like how, you know, as, as John points out that things kind of go black and white when, this particular part of her is activated and everything goes cold and she kind of freezes is frozen um, just by someone, someone new and treating on their house, Some, something unexpected, a change in routine, a change in scenario, a change in, in expectation. Um, and she just can't handle it um, at all. And I mean, the interesting thing is like Constance, I, I wonder, this is another one of those things that I'm not even sure if this is, there's enough text to support this, but like, that Constance has perhaps been trying to talk herself into getting out of this house for a long time. And every time she gets close, uh, Mary Catherine finds a way to kind of pull her back in, you know, like there, there there's a, a scene earlier in the book where Constance is talking and, and says something about like, Oh, maybe I'll go to the village next time or something. And like Mary Catherine is like horrified by that. Like, she's like, what? Like, like what? Like she's talking about, you know, going, leaving, and, and she's just like, no, 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 that can't be allowed. That can't be allowed. And so, like, how much of this is Constance is, is agoraphobic and how much of this is Mary Catherine is and, and, and kind of forcing her will on her older sister? And, and I don't think there's a clear answer to that. But, yeah, it's a it's a it's a fun question. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so so sort of tangent, John brings up the existence of the 2018 movie, which um, I didn't really know about until. Um, I was looking into the book and realized there was a movie. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen this movie? I have not, no. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, this seems like one of those books where uh, the the first-person perspective seems extremely critical and makes me feel like it would be really hard to nail down with a movie. But I, I guess I'll just ask the chat if anybody's seen it. Do they, do they feel like the movie pulls it off? Yeah, I think there's perhaps a reason why I've never even heard that there was a movie <laughs> made of this. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that someone made a movie out of this because people make movies out of everything. But yeah, I, I agree with you for sure. Yeah. All right. So we're going to, we're going to fast forward a little bit here. And uh, this is kind of the culmination of the Mary Catherine Charles resentment where Mary Catherine has gone into his room and stolen everything that belonged to her parents and replaced it with dirt and twigs and sticks and smashed a mirror and did all these things. Um, Mary Catherine, Charles said, I'm going to give you one chance to explain. Why did you make that mess in my room? There was no reason to answer him. He was not Constance, and anything I said to him might perhaps help him get back his thin grasp on our house. I sat on the doorstep and played with Jonas's ears, which flicked and snapped when I tickled them. Answer me, Charles said. How often must I tell you, John, that I own nothing whatsoever about it? Uncle Julian slammed his hand down onto the papers and scattered them. It is a quarrel between the woman and none of my affair. I do not involve myself in my wife's petty squabbles, and I strongly advise you to do the same. It's not fitting for men of dignity to threaten and reproach because women have had a falling out. You lose stature, John. You lose stature. Shut up, Charles said. He was shouting again, and I was pleased. Constance, he said, lowering his voice a little. This is terrible. The sooner you're out of it, the better. Will not be told to shut up by my own brother. We will leave your house, John, if that is really your desire. I ask you, however, to reflect. My wife and I... It's my fault. All of it, Constance said. I thought she was going to cry. It was unthinkable for Constance to cry again after all these years, but I was hell tight. I was chilled, and I could not move to go over to her. You are evil, I said to Charles. You are a ghost and a demon. What the hell? Charles said. Don't pay any attention, Constance told him. Don't listen to Mary Cat's nonsense. 
You are a very selfish man, John, perhaps even a scoundrel, and overly fond of the world's goods. I sometimes wonder, John, if you are every bit the gentleman. It's a crazy house, Charles said with conviction. Constance, this is a crazy house. I'll, I'll clean your room right, o right away. Charles, please don't be angry. Constance looked at me wildly, but I was held tight and could not see her. I just love all the different, like, this is getting near to the end of the book, and so we understand who all these characters are, and kind of seeing them all ping off each other in this really specific way, and, and the ways in which, through the, the Uncle Julian confusion, we're also learning more of what was happening in the Blackwood home uh, near the yes. end. Yes, Uncle Julian is a very important uh, plot device, or, or whatever, yeah. um, narrative device, I should say, because he, he conveys us... He, uh, uh, yeah, well, what I'll say is like when he's when he's in his like loquacious mode, he's crafting this image where everything was great and everyone was understanding mm -hmm. and the Blackwoods were awesome. And then when he has these like slips, um, you see that there was a lot of yelling. <laughs> yeah. And conflict. Well, and I love this. Like we're being kind of being told here that John's wife, John Blackwood, uh, Mary Cat's father, and um, Julian's wife were obviously in some sort of argument about yeah. something and we don't know really what i mean it's probably all related to the fact that they're staying with them and broke and and john is a, a tight ass cheap <laughs> cheap asshole even though he's rich um but we don't really know and then like this could be part of the tension and uh difficulties in the house that kind of caused mary catherine to do what she did right um but we don't yeah. we just don't know yeah. um i love how how biting the insult of i sometimes wonder john if you were every bit the gentleman <laughs> comes off as coming from him yeah and of course you have charles is just like complete exasperation with this whole thing it's just like yeah. this this place is nuts and he's not wrong right i mean that's like i don't like charles like it, it, the the book makes it very clear that he was just in this whole thing for the money he just wanted the money and that's that's what he was his his entire goal here was but like I just love the idea that he just came into the situation and like everyone's crazy and, yeah. and he's just like totally exasperated by the, like just like Mary cat just did a, a, a ridiculous thing by just trashing this guy's room for no reason. And, and Constance is like, don't, don't, just don't listen to her silly nonsense. I'll clean the room. and It'll be fine. I was like, no, no, this is a symptom of a larger problem. Constance is not just, Oh no, my room's dirty. And, and she, she just refuses to see it. She just refuses yeah. to. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that that's the problem is Charles and, you know, Helen um, are the two characters who are the most earnestly trying to give them a hand, mm -hmm. which is saying something because Charles is, you could barely call him earnest, actually. I mean, I think some part of him actually wants to help Constance, but like you said, mainly he's there for the money. I, I think I think he could, he probably exists in a world in which he is both there for the money, but also is telling himself that he he's going to actually help Constance. Yeah. Um, and that's how he feels good about the, the, the obvious greed <laughs> that he has. I, I agree. And, and then, and then the other character, Helen, I believe her name is, um, she seems, she seems more genuine, but also it's like the kind of help she's offering is something that I think Constance doesn't think will work it, it's like it's like you're basically saying you want to take everything away from me and put me in a room in your house mm -hmm. and like how is that better for me like i'm better off here in my house than i am just like crammed into one of your back rooms so you can take care of me mm -hmm. is is the way i see constance's worldview and then and then mary cat's worldview is very different but for some yeah. reason, I'm, I'm actually more concerned about like why why is Constance making the decisions she's anyway, um, yeah, that's that's, that's a great scene. I, mm -hmm. I love I love I love the um, everyone is yelling and things are are wild uh, moments of the story. Yeah, me too. Me too. All right, next we have what do we have? We have Mary Cat flees from the angry cousin Charles and sits in the summer home, remembering the way the family used to treat her, <laughs> or or rather not, or, or rather fictionalizing. <laughs> yeah. Inside was all wet and dark. I disliked sitting on the stone floor, but there was no other place. Once, I recalled, there had been chairs here and perhaps even a low table, but these were gone now, carried off or rotted away. I sat 
on the floor and placed all of them correctly in my mind in the circle around the dining room table. Our father sat at the head. Our mother sat at the foot. Uncle Julian sat on one hand of our mother and our brother Thomas on the other. Beside my father sat our Aunt Dorothy and Constance. I sat between Constance and Uncle Julian in my rightful, in my own and proper place at the table. Slowly, I began to listen to them talking. To buy a book for Mary Catherine. Lucy, should not Mary Catherine have a new book? Mary Catherine should have anything she wants, my dear. Our most loved daughter must have anything she likes. Constant, your sister lacks butter. Pass it to her at once, please. Mary Catherine, we love you. You must never be punished. Lucy, you are to see that you are to see to it that our most loved daughter, Mary Catherine, is never punished. Mary Catherine would never allow herself to do anything wrong. There is never any need to punish her. I have heard, Lucy, of disobedient children being sent to their beds without dinner as a punishment. It must not be permitted with our Mary Catherine. I quite agree, my dear. Mary Catherine must never be punished, must never be sent to bed without her dinner. Mary Catherine will never allow herself to do anything inviting punishment. Our beloved, our dearest Mary Catherine must be guarded and cherished. Thomas, give your sister your dinner. She would like more to eat. Dorothy, Julian, rise when our beloved daughter rises. Bow all your heads to our adored Mary Catherine. <laughs> I just love this so much. Yeah. I love how long it goes on. And it, yeah. It becomes increasingly creepy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you're, you get the, you get the gist of what's happening here almost immediately, but yeah, then, then Jackson continues it out and lets it, lets it fully roll out to the, where it just gets more and more disturbing. And you're like, Oh, and this is like, this is oh, like almost, I think just one chapter before um, the reveal of, of it being Mary Catherine that, that did the poisoning happens. Yeah. Right. It's it's great. It, it really is. Um, and I mean, I don't know, like, obviously, there's this this big this big thing she has with being sent to bed without dinner. Right. Like that is like one of the constant refrains. That is why she was not at the table um, the, the night of the poisoning. Yeah. Um, but there's an interesting thing where Mary Catherine doesn't like eating around other people generally. Right. Yeah. So like she's she she can't stand the idea of being sent away from the table her rightful place her rightful place is at this table but the the current version of mary catherine doesn't really like to eat around other people she likes to go off on her own and eat on her own and it's just like it's it's a really interesting way of that how that that idea of being sent away without dinner has kind of manifested in her being the type of person that likes to go eat by herself it's even possible that she never liked to eat around people and and she always did that which makes it even more ironic to think that she killed everyone for sending her away from the table even right. though she wouldn't have eaten at, the, eaten at the table anyway. That's so um, true because one of the constant refrains of this book is the stories we tell ourselves about things that happened. You know, one of my, my favorite bits that I remember so much is is Uncle Julian is sitting there thinking about the memoir that he's working on of all this stuff and he says, I'm going to do a kind thing. I'm going to write that my wife was much prettier than she actually was, right? And so like uh-huh. this is this is like the book kind of reaching out and shaking you and saying, look, these people are rewriting the past in, in ways that suit them specifically. Uh, Julian is doing it. Mary cat is doing it. Constance yeah. is probably doing it as well and, and pay attention to this. And so, yeah, like we, 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 it kind of calls into question every bit of what we're remembering. How, how much did this happen the way anyone is saying it actually happened? Yeah, that's true. Another thing that this makes me think about is like one of the things the book doesn't necessarily show it, yeah, I guess I don't remember when when it does certain things, but you know, it's easy to get in your head the idea of just like, oh, she's just like you know evil, and she killed everyone because she's evil. But then you see how she has these like intense physiological reactions when anything is slightly out of place, like yeah. when 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 a guy shows up who shouldn't be there, it, it's almost like she's like gonna pass out. Yeah. She's like she's like she's like gonna hyperventilate. She smashes the glass on the floor and she's just like freaking the fuck out. And um you can imagine that her being sent to bed without dinner was a sort of violation of the order of the way things are done. Yeah. And and so it wasn't like she was like in, in a in a fit of childish peak, like, I hate them because they sent me to bed without my dinner. It was like it it was beyond meltdown. It it was like psychotic break territory. Yeah. Um and I'm not saying it's like, you know, forgivable, but 
it's it's or something that can be overlooked but it's clearly the book later kind of invites you to reflect on the idea that maybe um maybe you can't just paint it with the brush that that was convenient for you to paint it with yeah certainly and and i think me sitting here in 2022 my reaction to that is oh well then she needs to get out of this house and go get the proper help but to your yeah. point in the time period this book takes place what was that even truly an option like was it i i don't think so i don't i don't think it was and that's one of like another book you know we talked about flowers for algernon a couple months ago but here here's another book where you know what do we do what do we do with a person who is is just not able to live in the normal the quote-unquote normal way people live and like it's very easy to look at this and be like oh well she should we should just work to fix her but you know, we can't, we can't do that. She's something's, something's kind of broken in her. Right. And, and what do you do with her in that right. case? And, and one of the things is, well, I mean, maybe she should just live in this house, you know, just spend, spend the rest of her life living in this house, having this kind of calm, orderly existence, where as long as things aren't overly changed, suddenly things will probably be okay. And, yeah. and, you know, that's sad. It's certainly a sad ending, but what else what else is there to be done here right yeah i, I think that's may, may, maybe that cuts closer to what i was trying to say about the 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 helen character where it's like what she's offering i think our, our characters maybe rightly know would actually just make their lives worse because of the the limitations that they're mm -hmm. living under yeah yeah so it's like you're you, you think you're offering to help and your heart is in the right place but that 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 doesn't help actually yeah like what does you know charging Mary Cat with the murder and and you know sending her to it wouldn't be prison because she's a child but sending her you know away to a home for the rest of her life like what does that what does that do really yeah well, like, I, I mean I, I think we I think what's funny is we we know they sent her to an orphanage while Constance wasn't there yeah so it's like oh so so that's the level of like care <laughs> that there were that she would be getting as a default in and fact she, maybe and it, we're told she almost died while at that orphanage and and you know you you want to just go oh because health conditions are probably terrible here but maybe it was just like so much trauma that she was just like losing it and wasting yeah. away yeah probably i mean that that probably goes into the mix of of, of her being horrified at the idea of leaving and, mm -hmm. and constance being horrified at the idea of, of leaving because it's like what and send her back to the orphanage yeah like where yeah yeah, yeah mm -hmm. right all right so uh mary cat goes into charles room and starts a fire and then as the fire begins to burn and people come to put it out, she grabs Constance and pulls her over to her secret hideaway. And this, Matt, is where we learn the twist that I think everyone saw coming. Pulling Constance, I hurried under the trees into the darkness. When I felt my feet leave the grass of the lawn and touch the soft, mossy ground of the path through the woods and knew that the trees had closed in around us, I stopped and put my arms around Constance. It's all over, I told her and held her tight. It's all right, I said. All right now. I knew my way in the darkness or in the light. I thought once how good it would, was that I had straightened my hiding place and freshened it, so now it would be pleasant for Constance. I would cover her with leaves, like in the children's story, and keep her safe and warm. Perhaps I would sing to her or tell her stories. I would bring her bright fruits and berries and water in a leaf cup. Someday we would go to the moon. I found the entrance to my hiding place and led Constance in and took her to the corner where there was a fresh pile of leaves and a blanket. I pushed her gently until she sat down, and I took Uncle Julian's shawl away from her and covered her with it. A little purr came from the corner, and I knew that Jonas had been waiting here for me. I put branches across the entrance. Even if they came with lights, they would not see us. It was not entirely dark. I could see the shadow that was Constance, and when I put my head back, I saw two or three stars shining from far away between the leaves and the branches and down onto my head. One of our mother's Dresden figures is broken, I thought, and I said aloud to Constance. I am going to put to de put death in all the food and watch them die. Constance stirred, and the leaves rustled. The way you did before, she asked. It had never been spoken, spoken of between us, not once in six years. Yes, I said after a minute, the way I did before. Oh man, um, so I, like as much as. I saw this coming. I think this reveal itself really, really works on me. And it's just a testament to how good the writing is here that like this moment yeah. really lands perfectly. I think what's great is the reveal is not that Mary cat was the one who did the poisoning. Mm -hmm. And you could say the reveal is the fact that Constance knows it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And you could also say the reveal is the fact that Constance knows it and doesn't really care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and that and, and also further that like as is stated here, there there is no there's no agreement between them. It's just something that's never come up, despite the fact that they both know exactly what happened. Yep. Um, and yeah, that's that's the way in which it lands. And I agree that it it, despite the fact that you basically know this, it's still an amazing moment, um, which is really really cool. Yeah. Um, it's c- completely. And I, I love, I love so much of this. I I love like. The, this, the writing i knew my way in the darkness or in the light i think that's so wonderful i love the way like so much of this book has been constance taking care of mary cat right like constance is the older sister she's obviously the caretaker she's the one that cooks for them she she kind of cleans she organizes the house and then we see in this moment that mary cat kind of takes command and is the one kind of comforting and helping her sister and saying like you'll be okay i'll take care of you it'll be fine i, I will watch over you it she kind of just like like immediately assumes the caretaker role here it's so much to the point that it makes me wonder if mary cat was just allowing constance to have that role while actually you know being the one like basically setting all the rules making all the guidelines defining their lives you know why is it that that wednesday is tidy up day is it because constance wants wednesday to be the tidy up day or is it because mary cat wants it to be the tidy up day you know and I love that. It, it, it's so it's like the, the 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 switch here is so immediate I, I i love it so much that's a really good point i never thought about about that but yeah it, now that you mention it you know they do seem to have more of like an equal partnership in a lot of ways in, mm-hmm. in certain moments and then in certain moments it seems like mary cat is the one in charge but then you kind of fall back into the idea that like Constance is clearly the one who is doing all of the cooking. Yeah. And that makes you think like, well, she's the mother figure here, Mm -hmm. but it's like, no, she's just the one who does all the cooking. That's her role. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Doesn't mean she's in charge. Uh Um, You you want to slot that immediately into the motherly role because of the gender stereotypes we have in our society and all these things. But yeah, you're, you're totally right. It's also, I, I continually thought it was darkly funny how, much cooking Constance was expected to do all the time. Yeah. I mean, even, even before the Blackwood family, um, you know, was murdered, right? Like she was yeah. the cook of the house. Like the, it, it, especially ironic considering these were extremely well off people that could probably just afford to have their own cook, but it was like, right. it was Constance's role. She, not only did she cook, but she maintained the garden. Like she did all these things. These were her jobs. And like, I'm not like, if you like doing that, great. Like if, if this was the thing that Constance genuinely enjoyed doing and gave her purpose, awesome. But it, it, the book never really shows any of the characters question that, except for, I think like, I think I think it was uh, what's her name Helen that was like, hey, it was kind of weird that like <laughs> the family expected you to do all these things. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's true. That, that, that yeah, that did happen. Um, mm-hmm. So that yeah, the book drew attention mm-hmm. to the fact that she's it, severely overworked, which maybe yeah. you know maybe part of the reason why she reacted to everything the way she did. Yeah, uh, Ryan points out that we never actually learned definitively why um, why they killed. Uh, why why she killed her family, right? Um, yeah, I I agree with you. It, we never like there's never a moment that like I did it because X. You know, we, I think we're it's given in hints and spots like you know being sent away for dinner, like being punished. Like there there are hints towards it, but yeah, we never like get a definitive reason. Yeah. Before I forget, um, I do somewhat wonder, and this is this is the page to talk about this on. I do somewhat wonder if Constance actually feels like it is her responsibility that everyone was killed because she told Mary Cat about all these poisons. Yeah. And and so she doesn't really blame Mary Cat she any more than you blame a snake for biting you or whatever. It's like she 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 told a child way too much information about poison. Yeah. <laughs> and then the child poisoned everyone and she's like, "Oh, I maybe I shouldn't have done that or maybe yeah. i shouldn't have showed her where the arsenic was and so she <laughs> feels responsible yeah no that's true that's true did you get the idea that that constance knew it was mary cat like immediately and that's why she washed the sugar bowl out immediately yes yeah i think she was covering for mary cat the whole time and she yep. knew it was her yeah um all right uh let's move on to the second to last slide here 
yeah, so here we have um, after, uh, sorry, what we have is uh, the house has been destroyed, but Mary Cat and Constance elect to remain. We had to walk carefully because of the broken things on the floor. Our father's safe lay just inside the drawing room door, and I laughed, and even Constance smiled, because it had not been opened, and it had clearly not been possible to carry it any farther than this. Foolishness, Constance said, and touched the safe with her toe. Our mother had always been pleased when people admired her drawing room, but now no one could come to the windows and look in, and no one would ever see it again. Constance and I closed the drawing room door behind us and never opened it afterwards. Constance waited just inside the front door while I went onto the porch again and closed the shutters over the tall dining room windows, and then I came inside and we shut and locked the front door, and we were safe. The hall was dark, with two narrow lines of sunlight coming through the two narrow glass panels set on either side of the door. We could look outside through the glass, but no one could see in, even by putting their eyes up close, because the hall inside was dark. Above us, the stairs were black and led into blackness or burned rooms with, incredibly, tiny spots of sky showing through. Until now, the roof had always hidden us from the sky, but I did not think that there was any way we could be vulnerable from above and closed my mind against the thought of silent winged creatures coming out of the trees above to perch on the broken, burnt rafters of our house, peering down. I thought it might be wise to barricade the stairs by putting something, a broken chair perhaps, across. A mattress, soaked and dirty, lay halfway down the stairs. This was where they had stood with the, fire, with the hoses and fought the fire back and out. I stood at the foot of the stairs, looking up, wondering where our house had gone. The walls and the floors and the beds and the boxes of things in the attic. Our father's watch was burned away, and our mother's tortoise shell dressing set. I could feel a breath of air on my cheek. It came from the sky, I could see, but it smelled of smoke and ruin. Our house was a castle turreted and open to the sky. Come back to the kitchen, Constance said. I can't stay out here. This makes me so sad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I like I didn't pull the slide of when the entire townspeople like turn on them. It's it's horrifying, right? Like think what you will about what this girl did to her family, but like the the moment the the gym guy goes from being fire chief and like very pointedly removes his hat as if removing that roll and then just picks up a rock and throws it through the window. It's just like, you fucking monster. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, that's, I mean, I, I, I know this is not our Stephen King podcast, but um, I definitely see why Stephen King admires uh, Shirley Jackson because mm -hmm. there's a lot of this idea of, of you know, th this like mob anger and, and hate kind of, kind of rejection of and hatred of the other. Uh, yeah. in Stephen King's books as well. Definitely. Um, I mean, and, and Hill House, uh, which I, I strongly suggest everyone that enjoyed this book read, um, is very much the same. It is about, you know, uh, it's about another old house where uh, it, uh, isolated people lived and uh, and about how people ostracize and reject and, and isolate. And it's just a, a lot of the same same ideas going on here. Yeah, the, the 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 word that kept coming up when I was reading about this book was 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 others and, and othering, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because obviously that's you know the the there is something different about the Blackwoods. I mean, number one, they set themselves apart with their wealth, but then also there's this tragedy that that befell them. And paradoxically, or or you know maybe not paradoxically, you would think like the 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 tragedy would somehow offset the. Um, the aloofness of their wealth but no. if anything it just makes it worse it's like yeah. they're now other twice they're double other and that just makes it worse it doesn't make it any better at all um which is uh really interesting yeah um ryan breaks up an interesting point that's like and i don't i'm not sure about this but the idea that perhaps constant showed maricat where the poison was because she kind of wanted her to do this thing that that she was unhappy with her family and the way things are going and, and wanted to get rid of them too and used her sister as kind of the tool to do that um that's certainly possible i yeah. i didn't i didn't have that read but it's it's possible and it's also possible that maybe after the fact she th she thought like well i did i did resent them for overworking me so hard and so maybe I did want that to happen mm -hmm. when it's like, well, you know, 
and tell yourself a story like that, even if it's not true. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think regardless of how much she was actively involved in it, I think the idea that you brought up and, and Ryan brings up as well, that she had guilt for this, I think is absolutely true. Yeah. All right. So let's read the, the final words of the book. My new magical safeguards were the lock on the front door and the boards over the windows and the barricade along the side of the house. In the evening, sometimes we saw movement in the darkness on the lawn and heard whispers. Don't. The ladies might be watching. You think they can see in the dark? I heard they see everything that goes on. Then there might be laughter drifting away into the warm darkness. They will soon be calling this Lover's Lane, Constance said. After Charles, no doubt. The least Charles could have done, Constance said, considering seriously, was shoot himself through the head in the driveway. We learned from listening that all the strangers could see from outside when they looked at all was a great ruined structure overgrown with vines, barely recognizable as a house. It was the point halfway between the village and the highway, the middle spot on the path, and no one ever saw our eyes looking through the vines. You can't go on the steps, the children warned each other. If you do, the ladies will get you. One boy, dared by the others, stood at the foot of the steps facing the house and shivered and almost cried and almost ran away and then called out shakily, Maricat, said Constance, would you like a cup of tea? And then fled, followed by all the others. That night we found on the door sill a basket of fresh eggs and a note reading, he didn't mean it, please. Poor child, Constance said, putting the eggs into the bowl to go into the cooler. He's probably hiding under the bed right now. Perhaps he had a good whipping to teach him manners. We will have an omelet for breakfast. I wonder if I could eat a child if I had the chance. I doubt if I could cook one, said Constance. Poor strangers, I said. They have so much to be afraid of. Well, Constance said, I am afraid of spiders. Jonas and I will see to it that no spider ever comes near you. Oh, Constance, I said, we are so happy. <laughs> I, just, I just love that as the last word of the book. Uh -huh. Like the, I, the the idea that like not I am so happy, but we are so happy. I am yeah. declaring that you, my sister, are happy. I, so so I'll just say like I didn't. That's the nice thing about audiobooks is you don't necessarily know when the last sentence is coming. Mm -hmm. But when she said, "Oh, Constance, we are so happy," I was like, "That's that's the perfect last sentence for this book." <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then it stopped. Like, that's yes. great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I I love kind of how this turns. You know. It's it's certainly a depressing ending to me in a lot of ways that we turn from these two women. They they become legends. Um, the townspeople, you know, send food to them constantly out of, you know, perhaps first at guilt and then maybe it kind of morphs into tradition from there. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 really it's really a fascinating idea of how the othered people become so othered that they kind of become legend and myth and, and they stop being actual people. Um, yeah. and they, they become as of gods. Like these are, right. these are religious offerings. Now they're not, um, feeding people. It's like, we're, we're kind of praying for forgiveness to the, the ladies, not, yeah. not making sure these two women are okay. Or, or just like to placate them at a step. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like part of it with like the rhyme and everything kind of reminds me of like bloody Mary or whatever, where it's like, it's like a nightmare figure. Um, it's a it's a horror figure and mm -hmm. you know i, I like that the note it said it says you know he, he didn't mean it please and yeah. it's like the, the please takes on this tone of like please don't you know yeah eat him please, please um, what like yeah, they, yeah they've never done anything like they, yeah. they they don't leave their house like right. they've never done anything to these people <laughs> they've never done anything to anyone except yeah. except for the one tragedy um well yeah but that's like only to their own like they've never done yeah. anything to the townspeople right. ever ever Yes, um, it was an intra Blackwood affair. Mind your business. <laughs> but I mean, I, I love I love that line. Like Chris points that out, the poor strangers they have so much to be afraid of, and that's that's a really fascinating line, right? Because, like, these these the 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 people that other these people are afraid of so many things are afraid of things that would never happen. They would never do any of these things. Like they're joking around cooking and eating these children, a thing that they would pro probably never actually do. Right. But I, these people would believe that they would cook and eat these children. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I agree. They're joking. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like they have so much to be afraid of. Constance says, well, I'm afraid of spiders. I was like, well, we can take care of that. You know? There's something that uh, yeah that, that's great. There's something about this whole um page that makes me feel like ten or twenty years have passed. Mm -hmm. Like like mm -hmm. they just sound, and it's not that the book says that like decades are passing, 
but it makes it feel like decades are passing. And the way they speak to each other here, Mary Cat almost doesn't sound like herself anymore. Like yeah. the types of things she's saying seem more mature. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's subtle, and, and maybe I'm making it up. Um, I guess I guess it can't have been decades because Jonas is still alive. Um, but but it's still it, it feels like they've just been. It feels like they're 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 growing into this existence of just living in these two or three rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and they're yeah, they're, I mean they're so happy. It, it's hard not to look at this and and just be like bummed out about it. You know, like that they're eking out this bleak existence where they're just by themselves the entire time in the ruins of a house that really only three rooms, if even like one of them sleeps on the floor. Like they have like. Um, her Mary Cat's only clothes are a uh, clothes like a, a picnic blanket. Like it just, but but it, the like this. I think this is one of the things the book is challenging you to do, right? Because according to my very normal existence and where I live, you know, very normally, according to what society says, all that stuff looks terrible. But yeah. you know, who am I to judge what a person decides to do, how they decide to live their lives? Right. As long as they're not going around murdering people all the time. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. That's the fun question it leaves you with at the end. You're like, is this actually better for them than the than the alternative? Mm -hmm. yeah. What is the alternative? What? Yeah, yeah. What What is an alternative life for for Mary Catherine that makes her happy, um, and and not? Yeah, like, cause, cause, I mean, to to John's point earlier uh, in the chat, like, this was this was the fifties that this book takes place in, or or uh, you know, late fifties, early sixties, whatever. This was if you had something mentally wrong with you, you were stuffed in an institution at best, uh, electroshock therapy at worst, you know? So like, what is, what is Mary Catherine's existence? And, and we, we tr like, what do people do? I guess that's one of the things the the main questions this book asks, what do you do with the other in a society that we like, you know, like what, what is the correct thing to do with the other? Um, and, these people try to destroy it, try to draw it out, try to pull it out of its existence and put it, take it out of its castle and put it in my home because that's where I think people belong. That's where you should be. That's what you're supposed to do. So that's what we're going to do. And these women reject that and say, no, we are going to, we have always lived in the castle. We're going to live in, this is our place. This is our home. This is our life. And this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, it's good, it's good stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. John is, is kind of discussing like a, a certain feminist reading that looks at sexual imagery that, that's present in the book, um, which I can't say that I noticed at the time, but like um, the the snakes being being Mary's enemy, um, the firefighters, quote unquote, pushing into the house with their hoses, um, <laughs> which I now that you now that you frame it that way, I, I, I agree that that is kind of that is there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I would not be surprised if that was intentional at all. All right. Well, that is We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Matt, we did it. We did it. What a great book. What a lovely book. I love it so much. Yeah. This is one of those short little books that's going to disproportionately stick with me and have an impact on my thinking, I believe. I agree. Um, with that, we are going to officially close the poll. And looking at the votes right here, it looks like Brando Sando has finally won, Matt. He finally <laughs> eked out a victory. Um, we will well, be reading The Emperor's Soul by Brandon Sanderson n next month. Well, it's good because that guy really needs a break, you know? Yeah. Brando Sando lately. Yeah, he's just he, not really – he's he's really just not doing well, you he's know? Been, he's been struggling, and I think he'll be happy to hear yeah. that the, he won. The Doof Media will be covering another one of his books. Yeah. Um, this is going to be another short book. I think this book is only about 170 pages, which – for Brandon Sanderson is basically like a, just a pamphlet. <laughs> yeah. Probably wrote it on the toilet. Yeah. I hear it still has a prologue though, even though it's 150 <laughs> pages. It still has a prologue. I <laughs> uh, can't wait. Can't yeah. wait. Um, so yeah, next month we will be doing uh, the Emperor's soul by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, the post showing all the details of that will be up next week, but for now, uh, here's the detail. Friday, July 29th at 9.30 p.m. Central Time, we'll be meeting right here to talk about The Emperor's Soul. Um, and so I think I think that's going to do it. I think we're going to go because Matt needs to go to bed because he doesn't feel good. That is correct. Yeah. 
thanks for hanging out, everybody. This was really fun. I really appreciate everybody's comments. Yes, yes. Um, there, there, were, there was a lot of conversation that we didn't necessarily reference because um, that's what good books do is they prompt a lot of, a lot of chat, and then we can't always keep up, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I was distracted by chat, that's, but yes. yes. That's, um, that's fine. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in live. Those of you listening uh, via the audio feed afterwards, we hope you will come next month to talk about uh the emperor's soul with us it's really fun to, to have these live chats uh, so please yeah on. yeah please do and if you like what we do here at doof media and you want to see more of it then head on over to our patreon at patreon.com slash doof media and consider donating to support our organization at any level available you will get access to the vote for the books that we talk about each month on the book club as well as a bunch of other exclusive features so check it out that is right. And if you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out to us and let us know what you think about We Have Always Lived in the Castle or next month's, month's book, The Emperor's Soul. Yeah, that's the title. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Twitter at Doof Media or email us at doofmedia at gmail.com. Or, of course, you can go to our subreddit. That's r slash doofmedia where we will happily chat about these wonderful books with y'all. All right. Thank you so much again. Uh, this was so much fun. We love doing these book clubs, and we hope to see you next month. <coughs> I didn't stop recording yet, so that sneeze is going to be in now. Great. I'll just cut it. All right. Thanks Thanks so much, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just sign right off um, so Matt can get some sleep. But uh, thanks for hanging out. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend, and, uh, and none of you get COVID like we have. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Catch y'all later. Bye Have bye. a good one. That was good. Yeah.